I'm super excited to be here with Doug Moran, Master of Fine Arts, longtime associate professor of fine arts. Doug, thank you for agreeing to meet with me. Doug, you have had some of your artwork, your creation bought up by the GSA. You have had your pieces in the federal courthouses in Florida in the 70s. Your artwork was purchased up by Smithsonian and put on display. You're famous in your world, but I have all sorts of questions for you. Can I start with something really simple? Like when you are making something that you would call your artwork, what is it that you see yourself doing? Oh, well, I guess I'm an artist. And to me, that means that that's the way I live. Uh, I've always considered art to be a way of life mm -hmm. as opposed to a product. I was always kind of anti-product. Uh, the notion that you make something or that you have work would suggest there's some tangible form in classic tangible forms in the visual arts. And I'm a visual artist when I wasn't being a performance artist. Classic tangible forms would be drawing, painting. So you don't choose, you don't I, don't, I, I have a placard in front of you. Should I just continue? Sculpture, uh, painting, you know, I, I think that, uh, I, I guess if I was gonna answer your question in a more roundabout way, art is what happens when I'm working. And I think that artists, mature artists, never speak in terms of uh, that's something that he or she created. It's that that thing or that slice of what's being considered from a body of work is his work or her work. Uh, that gets into the whole creation thing that we had a discussion about some years ago. And that I would, uh, I guess I could open by saying, I, I, I don't feel that I've, ever created anything. Um, I think the, the proposition of when I sit down to work has to do with the situation that I allow. And that would be materials at hand, time of day, uh, temperature, my own intellect, my own feelings about um, who I am, what I am, what's important to me. And then that all gets modified with <clears throat> concept and uh, intent. There's a whole bunch of words that are easier to talk about and define than <clears throat> creativity. And it would be like vision, uh, what you might, see coming out of a situation where you're quote working so you know if if, uh, if i go into the kitchen and there's there's beans and there's peppers and there's tortillas and there's rice and there's perhaps some pork and i start making something it's going to be modified by Who's going to be receiving it? Who's going to be eating this if it's going to be eaten? Uh, is it just me? Is it a group of people? Is it my wife knowing what her propensity is for not liking certain things? So I think that an audience is considered and the, the whole back to the food thing, you know, I, somebody might walk in and say, well, you're, you're making Mexican food because you have some of those things there, but I'm not, I'm making Doug's food. I'm, I'm, I'm cooking because I've brought into the situation uh, my own experiences, my own uh, eclecticisms, and 
I cook a lot like I paint, I think. And somebody said once that if you're a, a, a decent painter, you're probably a fabulous cook. And this isn't to put cooks down, but it's also the reverse of that would be that if you're a, a really good cook, that maybe you should try painting. Uh, recipes go away and you start to have a relationship with the materials <clears throat> in the process. So it sounds um, like you're saying something like, don't ask me what it is I'm making. Don't focus on the product of my work. In other words, don't focus on the created thing. But instead, there's some kind of magic in all the different parts that come together while you're working and somehow creation is happening as you're working, but but you're not creating some creative well, you know, thing. I'm gonna stub my toe every time you say create or creating. But why, why because, is that? Because, well, you have to suppose if I'm creating that I'm a creator and I'm not a creator. Um, why can't we call you a creator if you're creating? Well, you can call me whatever you want, but I don't call myself a creator. I'm the one that's going to go into the room and come out with a body of work. I'm going to go into a room and, you know, I was I, I went to a, a meeting once in, in the 70s with uh, some interesting people. I've, I've known, I've had the, the good fortune of, of sitting down talking to and, and knowing a number of really interesting people that sort of left indelible impressions on me. Um, it, this was uh, this was in Long Beach, California, and it was an assembly of uh, artists and thinkers and scientists. And there's Cooper Ross, and there's Len Lai, uh, there's myself, I was on a panel, there's John Baldessari. Uh, but one of the things that I, I came away from that with, and this was probably 1975, and so, at that time, I'd been teaching for two years. I'd gone through a, a master's program and I was feeling pretty on my game. You know, I was feeling pretty much like, almost like I might create something. <laughs> but I came away from that, that meeting having set in on uh, someone talking about holistic endeavors in the science and the, the word uh, holistic was, I think just really kind of sprouting, just really kind of coming to life in the, in the early mid seventies. And the whole notion that something was nothing but everything, that every bit of that, that large sum divided had all the qualities of the whole. Mm -hmm. So if you took a piece of pie, cherry pie, and you had this nice big round cherry pie, and I give everybody eight pieces, they all have cherry pie. The intrinsic qualities of the pie were divided, but one piece of pie knew everything about the other piece of pie. And <clears throat> someone was talking about accelerating atoms in a large block of steel on the East Coast. And through by charging electrons and by, and I'm not a scientist, but by charging those electrons, positive or negative, they could control the, the direction of that they were circling, maybe a nucleus or something. And that, that electron was a, a portion of a whole that had been divided. And some of it was on the West Coast and some of it was on the East Coast. And so the East Coast and the West Coast scientists are talking to each other. And instantaneously when the, the electron is charged with a positive charge on the East Coast, the electron on the West Coast mirror images what's happening to the electron on the East Coast. Len Lai made a statement and he said that artists and scientists we're really doing the same thing. They're engaged in very similar activities. 
And the activity was trying to find out something, trying to find something out. And so I went away from that and, and kind of put that on as a shirt and just became that. Um, rather than creator, I think investigator, questioner, seeker, wanting to find something out. Now, <clears throat> what does an artist want to find out? Good question. And, and <clears throat> advanced years later, probably six years later, I was having a dinner with a artist critic friend of mine from California named Peter Plagens. And Peter had been a, a guest artist at Claremont Graduate School where I was teaching at the time. And he was showing his paintings. And there were very like vague kind of ghost-like images in these paintings. They're dark and heavy. And, and we were at dinner later on. I have to back up a little bit because I had a painting going on in my studio and I had Boy, I can't, I can't go way back there. But the painting was about heritage and in a sense, knowing something about oneself through looking at your heritage because those things are inescapable. They're where you start, they're, they're, they're who you are. <clears throat> uh, and Peter said at dinner, he says, you know, he's in, I don't, I don't understand, Doug. He says, the, these swastikas keep looming up in my paintings. And, and I, I just don't understand it. I just don't know where they're from. But it's like, I, I don't try to put them there. But they, they just keep coming out. To which I said, probably after you know, a martini or two, I said, well, Peter, your heritage knows more about you than you know about your heritage. What I did, and Peter said, well, that, that's, that's really great. He's a writer. He said, that's really great. He says, you say that again? I said, well, your heritage knows more about us, or our heritage knows more about us than we know about our heritage. In other words, an artist kind of works to find out something, like the scientist works to find out something. But the scientist, I think, he's working to find out something about uh, science, about the world and the way things move and spin around about each other and, and medicine and all that stuff. And the artist many times is, I think, seeking information about himself or his inner feelings. Hmm. So rather than you know stumbling on that whole notion of being a creator, I consider my job when I'm working to first satisfy myself in my quest in that possibly this is the day, this is the time with these materials, with this dumb pencil and this blank sheet of paper where I address all my eclecticisms, everything that I know has been done before me by those people because I am a scholar and I have studied the last 200 years of contemporary American art history as well as European and I, I have a pretty good idea. I have a pretty good idea of what's been done. When I'm at the top of my most conscious game, my game of consciousness. Um, but it's not, it's not infallible. In other words, You can have a lot of ideas that have been had by other people and you don't know it. Uh, you'd be foolish to get the notion that you're gonna build a car and never go to Detroit and find out that they're there and they're on rubber tires driving around the street. You need to sort of, so in that, in that same sense, I think that uh, an education in your discipline is really important. You have to, be aware of what came before you so that you can somehow perform within the canon and 
on behalf of the canon of information that will be passed on to other artists, other musicians, other, other poets, other writers. Wow. And if you're really, really, really fortunate when you get to be my age, 72, uh, you think that maybe, maybe you'd, you'd, you can put your finger on something and you can recall something that was, was, was fresh and that you had uh, contributed to. And it would be shared with maybe three or four other artists that have similar interests. You know. But the notion, that, the notion that you're gonna go out and start with nothing. And, and, and that's the test I think for me is if you're a creator in, in the beginning, there was nothing. And so the finger went in the dust and now there's everything. Um, you'd have to somehow be able to like shut your brain down and have a piece of paper, which is a given. I mean, someone made that paper and you can stab a hole in it, or you can waddle up and make a ball out of it, or you can cut it and make a sculpture out of it, or you can take a pencil and somehow transfer thought to this piece of paper so that now you can see it. And if, if you can just get yourself to make a mark, a smudge, then perhaps through, because of who you are, what you're interested in, and your vision, your imagination, your skill, your facility, you'd make the second mark. That would have something to do with the first mark. The third mark that would have something to do with not just the second, but the first and the second. And the fifth would have something to do with the first, second, third, and fourth. And you'd know when to stop. And you'd know when to stop only if you are guarding yourself from embellishing a thought an exploration with superfluous, unnecessary stuff, adornments, which is why, you know, perhaps a line an inch and a half long, just properly placed on an eight by 10 piece of paper is so much more interesting to me than the drawing, the best drawing of a cat. The drawing of the cat is the result of seeing and using a facility to draw a craft and probably not bringing much to the cat, but, but the whole proposition that, you, that you're given a line, an inch and a half long, and your job is to place it on that page. What's the criteria for where it goes? You know, that's yours. You have to come up with that. Um, oh, that's minimalism. Doing, I think, just reduction, 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 reduction. And, and the minimalist, you know, starts, starts off by, you know, with the, the notion that uh, there, there's many, many, many more things that he or she are not going to do than there are, that they are going to do. And you have to make sure as soon as you see something that has been done or is leading you off in a direction away from fresh and new and exploration that you stop, rip it off, get another piece of paper. It's really hard to pull something out of nothing. So there's not um, many creators. And that's, that's the challenge I think is to try to pull something out of nothing, try to come up with something. And, and that's, that, that's a, it's a, what do I want to say? It's like the plague, you know? 
Well, that's that's the artist, you know. He's doing that when he's sitting on the toilet, when he's in the shower, when he's eating, when he's bored in a conversation with somebody else, not you. But when he's driving down the road or doing some diversional activity like playing a guitar, he's not really playing guitar if he's a if he's a visual artist. If he's a musician, he might be playing the guitar for the guitar, but probably playing the guitar is a diversional activity. So he doesn't have to do the really difficult thing of fresh thought, something that he's never considered before, she's never considered before, a statement that's never been made before. You know, there's so many ways to go about that. Um, my friend is dead. <laughs> uh, and I, I can call him a friend because I knew him pretty well. And we did a, a two-man show together in the 70s. Uh, John Baldessari, who's a, a conceptual artist. And, and, I, and I've always been akin to, I mean, I, I grew up, grew up, I went to college studying and uh, thinking about uh, Marcel Duchamp's more than the Albert Doors, you know. Um, there were concept people. And I've worked as a concept consultant for Imagineering. And, and uh, that's always been, I think, right, the most facile of my tools is my propensity to push concept and variation and abstraction. All those words are really, I think, as important, more important than, than create. But the activity of, of doing the work really has to do with uh, the big flush, you know? Get it all out of your head. Forget everything you learned in graduate school. Forget everything you had for breakfast two or three days ago. You had steak for dinner. Uh, two nights ago, it's probably still in you. It's going to have something to do with what you make. If you had a salad, it's probably gone and you've got a fresh start. But um, you, it's 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 really difficult to walk into the studio and have blank pages all around you. And pencils. It's easier to walk out than it is to make the first mark. You can spend the whole day in there and not make the first mark. So um, that's kind of where I'm at with the whole idea of, of creator. I'm not one. Uh, I've been a more of a, I think of a, I think about being in a lab. I was, I had a commission, it was a quarter of a million dollar commission to do a a large obelisk in California that uh, was outside of an office building. And um, the office building was near some rapid growth industrial tilt up, BMW's new plant and Schwinn's new plant and things like that were going a million square foot buildings. And, but the previous land usage was vineyards. Mm -hmm. and there were, the Basque sheep herders that kind of roamed the, the land uh, before that. And this was in the Chino, the LA basin, the, the Inland Empire area. And there was a mountain and there was a steel, Kaiser Steel was there. And there was Riverside was there and Riverside white Cement was the only white cement that was uh, being made in the country. And so when asked to do something, I wanted to somehow make a marker for the landscape and its use, previous and, and current use. You know. So I ended up with this large obelisk concrete form that came out of a migrant workers shack that was filled with 64,000 pounds of steel that rode on two bearings underground. And this was in the largest alluvial fan, which is a wind compressed wind 
uh, Pecan Pass, and uh, we get 100 mile an hour winds there occasionally, and it moved this very large, heavy form kind of erratically in the wind. And then if there was a large glass, thick glass cast piece of glass, there was a deep red, like a glass of wine with a, with a reference to the vintners. <clears throat> there was the migrant shack down below that the migrant workers would live in, in the area. There was, that was made out of concrete that was a white concrete with Arizona quartz. It was all bush hammer and it had black granite on top. And so it was kind of about the people in the area and everything. And it just kind of like was a pendulum that didn't go back and forth. It just kind of moved. So you get- well, I would never expect anybody to get my content out of it. Mm -hmm. Nor would I ever expect to chase people down one at a time and get everybody else's content, their content. So, um, you know, I think a, a work of art is half the deal. And the other half is the viewer. What you walk through, the intellect that you carry and you walk in, your willingness to see something. <clears throat> First off, not to judge it as being good or bad, or, or maybe even art, you know? uh, I think the artists are people that, that may or may not end up making something for you to consider for seven seconds. Might be a painting, might be a sculpture, might be the written word. And you change it, you finish it, you make it yours, you know, you take it what it is. You know, which is, I think, somewhat somewhat more flexible in writing. You know, the, the writer sees his thoughts on paper and reads them. And they become perhaps a whole different thing to him. You know? And maybe he says, I'm going to change that word. And so he takes that word out and puts another word in. And the whole thing's different. Now he's, he's like even smarter than he thought he was. But very seldom does he write it all down. And somebody from over there comes in and says, I'm going to change this word. And they take a word out, they put their word in. Mm. The writer reads it and says, No, that's not what I meant at all. It was wrong. Well, the artist, I think, once once you make something, you, it's it's almost like it's almost like you uh, you shoot it off into orbit. And it orbits around other people's heads. And it's theirs now. It's uh, not holistic because the, um, no two people know the same thing about anything they look at. You were a teacher and you had students and you're trying to bring out creativity. If you're trying to make them bring to their conscious mind, their heritage, if you're trying to teach people how to be artistic, how can you judge if somebody has been artistic it's well, that's that's tough you know the, the whole notion that you would go to art school to learn how to make art is really kind of silly you would go to art school i think to be around other people who have uh you know engaged in a similar activity in a mind expanding activity you look around the room and you see what's going on maybe you get you have the opportunity to um go to a professional artist studio, maybe an instructor's studio, not, not to, you know, like be tutored, but just to be let in, just to see the process and watch or see what it's like to make the commitment 
the decision to do this for the rest of your life. And I think that that's one of the really important things for young people to realize is the dangers of they were faced by evil can evil. You know, the guy that threw himself off the edge repeatedly, broke every bone in his body, got back on the bike, off the edge. And the, the, the dangers of deciding that you're gonna be an artist, I think is, I, th I think the only thing crazier would be <clears throat> to decide to be a poet. I mean, I always felt sorry for the poets, you know, because push come to shove, some somebody will come along and you know probably buy a drawing or something. I can I can usually eat. There's been times when I was scraping around in drawers after I quit my tenure teaching position to find enough money for a Big Mac. <clears throat> back when Big Macs were less than a dollar. And then there's been times when I'd find checks in the thousands of dollars that I'd forgot to cash. And uh, you, there's a certain commitment that has to happen to say, I'm going to, you know, my body of work is going to be about the inch and a half line, long line on a piece of white paper for the next 10 years, 20 years. And you may never get it in the right place. You may never find, you might collect bee pollen. You might spend the next 30 years uh, with tinfoil gum wrappers, making a giant sphere in, in your basement in Washington, DC. Uh, you might be Schwarzkogler and you know, chop off parts of your body. Uh, who, who knows what ends people will go to to try to know more about one thing than anybody else. And I think it's it's a little bit about it's a little bit like that. And if I got on my bicycle in 1975 and I rode through the streets of Miami, <clears throat> reading off to myself as a sketchbook activity, architectural blips like garden wall, gate, garage, drain pipe. Uh, curb, garden wall, driveway, red wall, blue wall, black wall, and, and did that 100 miles a week and come back into the studio and start to set up these linear situations where if that and that, then that and that and that. And what's the criteria for the ifs? If this and this, then that. We have to make it all up. And you start to like talking to yourself. And when you find yourself talking to yourself like that, you go out and you get some real tangible activity like fishing and a fishing buddy so that you can somehow keep a hand on the wheel, you know, a wheel in the ditch, a wheel on the road, and you can maintain your sanity so that you keep pulling that bizarre act of chasing the infinite nothingness of creativity, of originality. You can't start with anything but the awareness that of the, the, well, the awareness of everything that is and came before you. Just... Poetry Except. aside and, and words aside, so maybe short songs, literature, vignettes aside, you said that the many, many of the other arts are a portion of what the viewer brings a portion of what they feel is essential to the creation, right? You said the words are difficult, but with a sculpture or a painting, the viewer's content matters. So I, I'm curious, 
when when we're debating with other people two viewers debating about what something really is about or the artist and a viewer debating about really what is this thing about is there an authority if the if the, if the creator sorry if the the person because of whom something is now on display if the artist is saying well, if your work is really popular you're in deep trouble if if majority of the people think you're wonderful you're probably not worth a shit you know uh that's everybody the, the, there's always somebody that wants to be mayor and so there's always somebody that wants to be an authority and you know writers write and my work has been reviewed by numerous people and some of my thought kind of, you know, got it a little bit. Some of them just talked around it. Very positive. Somebody can, I, I've had very positive reviews that were uh, pages long and said absolutely nothing. They were just writing. And they knew nothing about the work. They saw nothing about the work. I've had reviews where, you know, some of uh, the, the top art critic in LA at the time, put me on the front page of the calendar section and went on and on and on and on and on and kind of got it right but the photograph of my painting was upside down and so <laughs> you know i don't really I, I don't really know too much you, you can't pay too much attention to that i'll go back to you have to give yourself the benefit of the doubt and why you're doing it you're doing it because you're trying to find something out and if you stop and wait for everybody to catch up you won't have the experience that has been the rule of thumb for the last, for, for hundreds of years. And that is, um, there's a lag between public awareness and what the artist is thinking and doing. And if it goes with the couch and it goes with your decor, the artist has probably made sacrifices that he never should have made. Hmm. For this, for art's sake, you know. But that's <clears throat> we're probably running out of time. But that gets into the whole thing about vision to in in concept and intent. You know, a person could be standing on a hill of ants, red ants, jumping up and down, and that's what it's about. Hmm. Somebody else could be jumping up and down, and it could be dance, and uh, you know, you can make art about war. You can make art about love. You can make art about food, about eating, about starving. And you can make art about... Uh, so why is it bad for someone to say why is it why is it what bad yeah why is it bad for someone who's about to paint to say well this has to go in the living room and the living room has a magenta theme so i ought to use colors that go with magenta why is that kind of limitation i don't think I, art no no there's nothing it's, it's not bad it's just it's that's not what I've involved my life doing. You know, that's what they're doing. They, I'm not a. Right. I'm not a interior decorator. So why they're is that kind decorator. of thing less ideal? But then you earlier you were saying that what's really important for an artist or an inspiring artist, it's really important that they learn the canon, that they learn history, that they see what's been done, that they try to work within that and contribute to some existing historical context in their medium or with that art how, how can we make sense of i should learn my medium learn the history learn the literature and make something within that canon but when i'm being artistic i shouldn't be thinking well I, you know Okay, well, you, you know, I'm being asked this question by someone with a PhD. 
Yeah, okay. <laughs> Why did you do all that? Why didn't you just get off the bus and start lecturing to people about the meaning of life? Why did you go to college? Why did you arm yourself with those tools? Why did you have those, those, those indicators? Why did you assimilate those indicators that would keep you moving in a forward direction? Why do you want to go forward? Now, if you don't want to go forward, you know, you can, you can paint, you can paint mauve and aqua panels for the rest of your life and put them in the same room or different rooms or whatever, but it has nothing to do with art. And I don't think that art, capital A art, is some kind of a, I don't think that's, you know, I, I don't think that's godliness. I don't think that's angelic or anything. It's just a, it's just kind of a description of what, I mean, historically, <laughs> The person that makes art for art's sake is probably the hungriest. Uh, maybe, what, maybe cut their ear off. Uh, what's, the, what's the difference? Someone just went crazy. Mm -hmm. But you see, I can, I can, uh, like I said, I, I made the reference to Weber Barbecue Group. I think it's a decision you make early on. Do you want to make a product to sell to America on QVC or whatever it's called? that you know, 2% of the people will buy for $10, you'll be a gazillionaire. Do you wanna be a gazillionaire? I mean, after you're a millionaire, what do you do with the other millions? You stack them on, you stack the old money on top of the new money and eventually it falls over and what you've got is a mess on the floor. And um, I, I think that there's a, well, I can tell you this, there's a tremendous, sense of riches when after being in your studio in 1982 working on one painting that's 17 feet long another painting that's 15 feet long and a couple other small pieces going out locking the door going to the airport flying away coming back in 30 days, putting the key in the door, walk in the studio, turn on the lights, and you have no idea where this work came from. You are astounded that you made it. You can't remember starting it. You don't know how you got to where you are standing in front of these, this, this document of how you spent 45 days with the phone off the hook, people dropping food off, literally. And it took you 30 days to like separate from it, to come back and see it fresh and there's a tremendous sense of riches in that you don't get that selling barbecue grills yo-yos panels that go with the couch you know those things go to museums and people walk up and they look at it, and if they look at it for seven seconds, you've got them. Because most people just walk past them. They walk over and read the tag. They might want to know what the title is because that might help them either figure out if they're thinking right or a hint to how to think about it. They might want to know who did it because they, but it's almost a guarantee that if they spend seven to 10 seconds in front of this thing that they've never seen before, that it'll make sense to them someday in their life while looking at something else, yeah. thinking about something else. Oh, well, I saw that, or I did that. Well, there's revelation and there's concealment and uh, 
sometimes, you know, you make something and, and you get it and you get it because of the voice of the materials, because of the accident, you know, you set up in your studio and you put out the white paper and you've got this line, you're thinking about where to put it. And uh, you came in with this cup of coffee and you set it over there and Sahar comes in with a hula hoop and uh, a sombrero and a skirt and does a pirouette and knocks something over into the coffee and the coffee bounces off my shirt and some of it goes on to the paper. And I turn the paper upside down and I go, yeah. <laughs> then I start to draw on it. It's mm -hmm. the beginning. John Cage, uh, dead. I had the good fortune of knowing John Cage, working with him, and I made a print with him in Michigan. And uh, grained a big litho stone, and he'd make a mark, and I'd make a mark. He'd make a mark, and I'd make a mark. He made a mark, I made a mark. I made back and forth. Tennis. Oh, house of cards, but, you know, he's just kind of going off of each other. And a little bit, that's what art, that's what the art community is like, except um, I found a very different thing on the West Coast than what I experienced on the East Coast. On the West Coast, it's like people were, their studios were locked, they were closed, you know, and mine was very open. The people that came in my studio, I realized that, you know, things weren't that way. You don't, I mean, there, everybody was like trying to like get a jump on somebody else. It was like almost competition among artists. And I don't think there should be a competition among artists. I think the visual arts is a visual communication. And I think that, uh, you know, your, your obligation to either make the word align so literally properly discernible that you can make the point with a spoken or written word, or you make the thing and then you show it. And that's what the visual arts is about. It's a, it's a form of communication. As a language, all it's to itself. And that's part of the problem. That's part of the problem is when, when uh, people that are not versed in the visual language, that are not, don't have an awareness of a foundation of all the things that have been made before, all the things that have been thought of and tried and put out there, you know, somehow gained a place in, in art history someplace. Uh, if they don't have that, then they try to use another language to relate to, to that work. Good art, bad art living room art, dining room art.